Good afternoon. I am Kyle Bradshaw, a junior here at Calvin, studying geography, and I'd like to welcome you to the January series 2016. Please take a moment to silence your cell phones. And while you are doing so, we'd like to give a special welcome today to the guests at three of our 48 remote webcast sites, Sioux Center, Iowa, Troy, Michigan, and in my home state, Linden, Washington. We'll be gathering questions for our speaker today through Q&A cards available with our ushers or by email or Twitter. So feel free to start thinking of those and start sending them in. Our moderator, Karen Sape, will gather the questions and present them if time allows. And now, will you please pray with me? <clears throat> Gracious God, we thank you that the earth is yours and everything in it. We thank you for creating beautiful mountains and forests and canyons and for giving us the honor of being caretakers and stewards of these places. Lord, we thank you today for our speaker and for our National Park Service that has spent many years protecting and caring for both wild places and places of historical importance in our country. Today we ask that you would open our eyes to see the wonder of your creation and our ears to the words our speaker has for us. We love you. Amen. And now, Will Katerberg, Professor of History at Calvin, will introduce our speaker. Good afternoon. How many of you have visited national parks? Perhaps as kids, a lot, or perhaps with your kids, packed into a car or a minivan, taking to the highways to see the nation's history and landscape. In 1872, President Ulysses S. Grant created the first of these national parks, Yellowstone. Presidents designated more parks in the decades that followed, and in 1916, the federal government created the National Park Service to manage the growing system. This year, we celebrate the 100th year anniversary of the National Park Service. The park system includes more than 400 areas and 84 million acres in every state, the District of Columbia, American Samoa, Guam, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands. This is parks, monuments, battlefields, recreation areas, seashores, scenic trails, and much, much more. One of these trails, the North Country Trail, runs through nearby Lowell, Michigan. Historic trails cross the Nebraska farm where Jerry Krakow grew up. After high school, he went on to Peru State College. Later, he earned graduate degrees from the University of Wisconsin and the University of Colorado and he became a history professor at Missouri State University in Springfield. Dr. Krakow began working as a park historian for the National Park Service in 1983. In 1995, he became superintendent of national trails for the Intermountain region. These included the Trail of Tears and the Pony Express Trail. Dr. Dr. Krakow researched and mapped trails all the time committed to helping visitors and students understand the history found in the national park system. Calvin College is grateful today to the Melema Program in Western American Studies and the Calvin Academy for Lifelong Learning for underwriting this presentation. Dr. Krakow will be available to greet members of the audience in the West Lobby following his presentation. Please join me in welcoming him today to Calvin's January series. Thank you very much. It's an honor and a privilege to be here. Peace be with you. In the introduction, as Will presented it, um, it's noted that I reside in New Mexico. And I must say that it's good to be in the USA, especially as a resident of New Mexico. We often have a statewide joke of misunderstanding that New Mexico is a state in the Union. <laughs> 
and not a foreign country. So it's good to be in another part of the USA, and I want to assure you that New Mexico uh, is a part of the United States. <laughs> to begin with, I would like to express my thanks to the Council of Independent Colleges and the Woodrow Wilson Visiting Fellow Program for arranging my visit here, and to Calvin College in inviting me under auspices of the Council. A special thanks to President Leroy, the faculty and staff of Calvin, to the lifelong learning friends of Calvin, and especially I want to say thanks to the students of Calvin. Thank you very much. In particular, I'd like to thank Christy Potter, uh, who's worked with me in coordinating much of my visit, and to Professor Will Kateberg for his assistance and coordination. And a special shout out for graphics that the wizard named Carl has provided me and helped me because I'm impaired, technically speaking, uh, <laughs> on that front. So it's good to have the security blanket of Carl, and I will request of him uh, certain slides to be put on the screen. One of the, one of the things that I enjoyed already here, and I must extend my thanks for the wonderful hospitality shown me here at Calvin and, and by groups and individuals and students that I've met with, is that it's especially fun for me to talk to students because that's our future right here. It's those students who are going to be leaders soon that will carry on the efforts that all of us have made in our lives as citizens of this country and citizens of the world. Uh, my, my announced topic is the National Parks, America's Best Idea. And this oft-used used description, such as by Ken Burns and Dayton Duncan in the PBS series, The National Parks, uh, is often attributed to a writer named Wallace Stegner, who taught writing at Stanford University and the University of Utah, who wrote an article in 1983 about America's best idea. Um, additional research has pointed out I haven't had a chance to talk to Will about this. I poked around a while, but apparently that phrase was uttered, of all things, by a British ambassador to the United States at the turn of the 20th century. And it's been shaped into this notion of America's best idea. Doesn't make any difference, does it, as to the source. It's still a worthy description, I think, of the nation's setting aside park lands for present and future generations. Now, there are a lot of symbols regarding the National Park Service. I'd like uh, to have the slide of the arrowhead projected uh, on the screen. This is one of the symbols that you often see. Uh, it's incorporated into a design that not only has the name, but there's nature in that scene, the bison, the trees, the lake, the mountain. And of course, there's a lot of history and archeology span associated with the arrowhead itself. Um, it's relatively recent. Uh, it was created graphically in 1951. And it was first used at one of those little places. I had a question in the lifelong learning audience this morning about national monuments. It's in one of those little places called Oregon Caves out in southwestern Oregon that came up with the idea that has become sort of the symbol of the Park Service. The other one I would quickly add, and I thank Mark Weaver, the superintendent of the North Country National Scenic Trail, for bringing in this flat hat. This is another symbol of the National Park Service and Mark spared me a whole lot of things, including carrying mine in a case from New Mexico uh, to Calvin. So thanks for the prop. Uh, it's, it's a good prop and a reminder of, of the agency. I've, I've sort of divided my presentation today, and there will be time for questions, into three parts. 
Uh, one is the national parks, and I'm doing this chronologically. The national parks will be one. The, the second will be the National Park Service. That's the centennial that Will spoke about. And the third part, and there won't be a quiz, I'll spare you that. The third part is the centennial of the National Park Service, what's celebrated this year. Actually, the centennial officially is on August 25th of 2016. But at the end of last calendar year, there were 409 units in the national park system. Scattered from Alaska to Hawaii to Florida and Maine, uh, the National Park Service manages a huge variety that nomenclature often obscures. Let me rattle off a few things that, that you've heard or visited before. National parks like Isle Royale or National battlefields, historic sites, memorials, recreation areas, parkways, lakeshores like pictured rocks, seashores, rivers, and other park units. And that other is kind of the miscellany. But think of all the units uh, as, as beads on a string. And I need to get a prop because it took my wife and I some time to get this prop together. It's in my briefcase. I want to illustrate, imagine that you have 409 beads on this string, and you can touch them in various places, and by the show of hands, many of you have touched them already. But each bead would represent one of 409 today. One of the recent ones in the United States is a, a, a War of 1812 site south of Detroit called River Raisin. Have you heard of that national park site? Work that into your visits this calendar year or next year. I think it's just getting off the ground, but it is a War of 1812 site. Uh, that's one of these beads on the string. Uh, I, I would also, as an old hand of the National Park Service, I'd underscore one other thing that, that Will mentioned in his introduction, and that is the national trail system. And the North Country National Scenic Trail goes right through this area with its offices in Lowell, Michigan, of the National Park Service North Country Trail Office and the North Country Trail Association, the Friends Group or the Advocacy Group for the, Nas for the National Scenic Trail. This is yet another piece of nomenclature in the National Park Service, like parkways and memorials, seashores and lakeshores and parks, on and on. It's, it's something that's difficult to manage, I think, and we get into an alphabet soup of all sorts in describing it. But across the nation, there's a network of national trails, and I, I will speak more about that later and have um, a graphic regarding it. I, I would like to mention, since I, I need to, to respond to Christy and to the January series in a, in a thoughtful way, and that is not show you a 40-minute film and we'll call it good. Um, but I was reminded of something that my wife read and then I read in a recent Smithsonian Magazine, uh, debuting on February 12th, is an IMAX-sized movie called National Parks Adventure. National Parks Adventure. Perhaps there's a theater or an IMAX near you. You might catch that, that uh, movie that's a commemorative of the centennial. Uh, and it's narrated, apparently, with perspective by a mountaineer named Conrad Anker and friends, and it looks at national parks. I think it's going to have a, a bit of a spectrum of all kinds of parks and isn't just a national wow you with scenery and grandeur of the national parks, which I love, which I suspect you love, too, and which is part of this notion of the, of the of the best idea. But 
In, in deference to showing you 40 minutes of film, I want to show you a short YouTube video of film that was put together for really that monitor on your computer screen and not the size of this. But um, Carl, would you put up the YouTube video? It's, it's about five minutes long. It's going to be graphically sort of fuzzy, maybe grainy, but it gives you a little bit of an idea about the national parks. Please. I joined the service because I believe in the mission and because I want to see this land preserved. As far as you can see, this is the homeland of our people. I think we have to be worried about the future of anything that really takes a strong vigilance to protect. I think it is a travesty that the National Park Service ever considers itself a land management agency. It is an agency that manages ideas and ideals. We tell the stories, American people. We tell the stories of the tribal people. We tell the stories of all the people. And there's a, something about uh, wilderness that modern man needs. It's just a great mission. I, I, I love the idea of uh, protecting, you know, that natural world. Through picturesque North Gate, we enter Yellowstone National Park. Since the beginning of time, nature has carried on the never-ending creation of fantastic wonders in Yellowstone National Park. Keep this one great wonder of nature as it is there now. There were special places that needed to be preserved. Keep it for your children and your children's children. The defining moment is clearly the establishment of Yellowstone National Park in 1872. And for all who come after us as the one great sight that every American should see. The park idea is it's beneficial to a society to set aside large tracts of natural land as we'll leave them unimpaired for future generations there had been the beginnings of a historic preservation movement in this country and this was part of the expansion of the park service nothing can replace the feel of a historic site the artifacts are documents they tell us something about ourselves how we live uh, what's important to us. The lady is beautiful. She's a symbol of freedom in America. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to be free. They're our future generation. They're the ones that's going to be helping to preserve these sites you know, in times to come. The United States became the United States right here. It's rather a, a moving experience to actually see where it all happened. The presidency was born that here. That all men are created equal. Life, liberty, and pursuit of power. You're in the very center, the very core of what it means to be an American. Going to a monument and understanding the history and the, the sacrifice that went into the reason that that monument's there. As I would not be a slave, so I would not be a master. This expresses my idea of democracy. Historic places have power because they're real, because they're authentic. December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. 
When I came to the wall and touched that wall, I felt my friends in there. I, I know they're here in spirit. Each national park is a story, and the stories have the meaning of the American people. There's not a lot that binds us all together. One of the things that does are these parks. And I'm not worried about the, the future of the Park Service as an agency as much as I am about the parks. One of the wonderful things about the National Park idea is that it's never done. Work's never finished. Thank you, Carl and crew. You saw the system across the land. Well, there's another way to depict this. Uh, I have a slide of the United States and the national parks. It was not intended to be projected this large, but I would like the map of the United States to be projected now, if you would, please. I, I apologize in advance for the text that's run together, but the point is that you can see National Park Service areas scattered across this land. As Will mentioned in his introduction, from the Western Pacific to the Caribbean to Alaska and Florida, all kinds of ways it crisscrosses the United States. Did you see any scenes that you recognized in that five minute video? Have you been to some of those places? I suspect you have. The murmur is encouraging. I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad that you have visited some. And to jump ahead to that centennial piece, one of the lines that's being used is find your park. The admonition for all of us this centennial year is to find your park. So it, it may be a municipal park here in Grand Rapids. It might be a national lake shore, or it might be a big national park like Great Smokies, something like that, but find your park. Well, how did this idea all come about? This notion that we should set aside land and protect and preserve it especially for future generations. It's, it's important, I think, uh, and would you turn that map off, please? I'm, I'm egotistically enough that I want you to look at me now instead of that map, but uh, uh, anyway, I'll use that technique. Um, how did this all come about? And in, in quick summary fashion, and I, I ask, um, for your forgiveness because I'm trying to teach a three credit course here in 40 minutes. But nevertheless, uh, the idea of wilderness is an important one. And we jump ahead and we look at wilderness that is represented in our national parks. But if you think back to scripture, you know something about wilderness, don't you? And you know there were some voices howling in the wilderness and there was some exile uh, and in, in our Anglo-Saxon world, or especially our West European world, there's, there's a notion that wilderness is not good. We, we maybe should stay out of it. And I think Western Europe developed it to a higher degree than we did because forests are dark. There's evil in those forests. There's trolls under those bridges. We need to watch out. And so there's this notion of, of the wilderness needs to be conquered. Do I need to remind you of European colonists coming on the Eastern seaboard or Spanish colonists coming up the Rio Grande Valley from what is now Mexico, making inroads, driving salience into uh, what is now the nation? Well, that whole idea of controlling the wilderness, conquering the wilderness becomes, 
an idea that propelled us all across what is now the United States of America. You remember that term that you had to memorize years ago for a history exam where you define manifest destiny? Do you remember that term? The idea that it was God's will that a superior civilization spread across this land and it just fueled all kinds of resource use, sometimes not wise use of resources, but it, it fueled people to go. Among them, for example, missionaries to the Pacific Northwest like the Whitmans and the Spaldings that were going to go out and Christianize the Indians uh, in, the, in the Pacific Northwest. That was a powerful motive to spread. And along came also the notion that the nation is spreading. We need to prevent the British from conquering the Northwest. We would therefore try to get that line moved back from the fur trade grounds in the Pacific Northwest, and it became the 49th parallel. Although at one time we called it 5440 or fight. We were, we were going to take them on. Well, uh, fortunately, there was some diplomacy used, and that 49th parallel is our boundary between us and Western Canada, uh, but then um, Great Britain. Well, all of these notions, I think, kind of developed in us a, a frontiering that we were spreading our superior civilization, but it's sometimes described as there's an unlimited amount of land we can farm. There's an unlimited amount of trees we can lumber. There's unlimited resources in the mineral wealth of gold and silver, uh, iron and copper, so on, that we can develop as we exploited resources. Uh, and, and those ideas all kind of come together. And so for a nation then to come up with an idea of setting aside land as a park is, is kind of contrary. In some ways, it's a paradox that, that you see uh, the nation engaged in. Um, the, the, the whole notion of use of resources might be summarized in a, in a phrase that, that talks about the farmer who, who wore out three farms and four and a half wives in the course of his lifetime going west. He was starting over, perpetually starting over. He was going to uh, gain some advantage by starting over. And if you have this idea in your head that there's more out there, and if, if you're not doing as well as you want, you can kind of reinvent yourself somewhere else. And so there was a lot of movement west kind of predicated on that idea. So woven in there is conquering wilderness, of the manifest destiny of spreading to the Pacific coast uh, and the notion that you're, you're doing uh, good by bringing a superior civilization across the land. Well, out of this grew ideas that um, maybe literature recommended in, in such writings as Thoreau and Emerson, the need for energy, excuse me, the need for nature as an energizer of the civilized world, as one of them put it. Uh, subduing the frontier is another notion, and I, I, I'm going to spare them, Will, talking about the frontier thesis here because that's, that's a little overboard. But the point I'm making is set aside land, and that's where the national parks as an idea comes in initially. Did you know, for example, one of the very earliest preserves was a group of hot springs in Arkansas that's now called Hot Springs National Park. There were medicinal waters there that were to be enjoyed for whatever ailed you. And so in, in 1832, Hot Springs Reservation was set aside as a preserve in Arkansas, but it wasn't a federal action, that didn't come until uh, 1921 when Hot Springs was set aside as a national park. Uh, 
And if you visited there, there's a row of bathhouses by all those springs coming out of the, of the subsurface that you can enjoy uh, marinating in for however long you want. Um, enough of that metaphor. Um, an, another example of set aside was a state park in California in 1864. Uh, Yosemite was its name. And the proponent of Yosemite was a fellow from across this big lake named John Muir, who grew up in Wisconsin, kind of on the frontier in Wisconsin. He went to college for two and a half years at the University of Wisconsin. He didn't complete a degree, but what he did was leave Wisconsin for what he called uh, the University of Nature. He was going to get in tune with nature in the course of his work as, as a kind of preservationist. And to Muir is often given the, the label of the founder of the use of the term preservation, to preserve, uh, to set it aside, and, and to keep it for future generations. And Yosemite was the first of that as a state park in 1864, just at the end of the Civil War. Um, the, there was a, a, compare, a, a competing philosophy uh, at, at the same time that Muir was espousing preservation, and that was uh, a man named Gifford Pinchot who espoused the idea of conservation, and he is it attributed to coining that phrase. Conserve means to use, not preserve, but to use, wise use. That's a philosophy and a view of some of our federal agencies managing public lands like a national forest or the Bureau of Land Management out in the western states where I reside. A Pinchot at first was, was pretty friendly with Muir or Muir with Pinchot, but their different philosophies certainly uh, diverged further and further apart when Pinchot uh, came up with the idea from study at Yale. He did a personalized major at Yale University that is now called a major in forestry. And after he completed this personalized major, he went off to Germany to study how the Germans managed forests. And they treated forests like farms. They grew trees. And you reproduced trees and you harvested them systematically like you might do a field of corn or wheat. And he came back to the United States imbued with this idea and uh, along with others created the agency called the National Forest Service. And Pinchot was named as the first chief of the National Forest Service. And that agency uh, became a conservation agency in the sense of wise use, and you make use of those resources, like you harvest timber, uh, perhaps other things. Increasingly, the Forest Service seems to be engaged in recreation work, and, and certainly um, those in the audience here that are familiar with the North Country National Scenic Trail will know some of that routing goes through national forests. And, and that, that is a kind of form of rec recreation, I would argue. Well, Pincho had a friend in the White House eventually whose name was Teddy Roosevelt. And Roosevelt was persuaded by others and his own views because he spent some time becoming a 200-pound muscular fellow instead of a 119-pound weakling. He went out to western North Dakota and lived on a ranch at, near Medora and came back with the idea that there was, there was gusto to be on the frontier or out on the edge of the frontier. And I remember images, reading images of Roosevelt clearing all the room in the White House of furniture. It must have looked like this stage. And then they put up maps of the United States, especially the Western United States on the floor. Can you imagine Pinchot and TR crawling around on their knees saying, let's set aside this one. No, let's do this one and that one. And all over this room, they were setting aside national forests and they were doing it by executive order. It, it wasn't 
Congress taking action, but it was by executive order. Now, some national forests came into the system through congressional action, to be sure, or had lands added to them. But the notion that uh, you, would, you would have conservation was a competing theme. Well, Muir became so, so keen on the idea of Yosemite that he was able to serve as, as a tour guide, you might say, to Teddy Roosevelt and other prominent Americans. Uh, and, and Yosemite was moved into action later as a national park. But the, the initial idea really was as the introduction that Will gave. In 1872, there was land set aside in northwestern Wyoming called Yellowstone. Now it touches into a fringe of Montana on that western and northern boundary. But Yellowstone was the first set aside. And it's fun to read about Yellowstone because it was kind of considered a freak of nature. Where can you find mud bubbling up, boiling up out of the ground? Where can you find hot water shooting out of the ground in, in streams that were magnificent? And all this forest backdrop that you had and all of that scenery and waterfalls on the Yellowstone River, upper and lower falls, the Lamar Valley replete with all kinds of wildlife, especially a, a little herd of bison that became kind of the seed herd of much of the bison that we see around the United States. I mean, had they not done that, we wouldn't have been able to have that bison on that National Park arrowhead, right? No, that's not so. Any, anyway, the, the idea of setting aside land at Yellowstone was, was captured oft times by the idea that it's a freak of nature. But I can assure you, it did not just happen around the campfire. Do you remember that romantic description of this campfire in Yellowstone and the idea was brought about? Why don't we set this aside for future generations? That contributed, but that little group around the campfire had individuals like Thomas Moran and William Henry Jackson recording the moment, you might say. Moran painted magnificent pictures of Yellowstone, the Upper and Lower Falls, for example. And Moran's paintings found their way back to Washington, D.C. And the Congress saw the beauty and grandeur of this land that was proposed as setting it aside. William Henry Jackson was a photographer. He shot black and white. You remember those days? Black and white photography. And Jackson captured a lot of the scenes. And that was a message brought back east to the Congress to provide some, some momentum about setting aside this park, this land rather. And, and then there were the railroads especially the, the Northern Pacific Railroad, it hauls freight, right? Do you think of yourself or do I think of myself as freight? Well, they knew that humans would ride the rails. And that was another important impetus to setting aside this land because they could haul passengers close to the set aside land of Yellowstone. And they had dozens and dozens of broadsides and timetables and posters and calendars. They promoted this Yellowstone country. And that's an idea that's used for years by other railroads, not just the Northern Pacific, to convey the idea. Well, Congress got into the act in 1872 and set aside the land. And I, I want to quote something um, to you from a book called Preserving Nature in the National Parks. There, there was a, an author writer named Robert Sterling Yard who wrote in a magazine back then called The Nation's Business. And this is what he sized up Yellowstone uh, as a reason for having set aside land. He said, you can manage this land in a businesslike way. We want, I quote, our national parks developed. We want roads and trails like Switzerland's. We want hotels of all prices from lowest to highest. 
We want comfortable public camps in sufficient abundance to meet all demands. We want lodges and chalets at convenient intervals commanding the scenic possibilities of all our parks. We want the best and cheapest accommodations for pedestrians and motorists. We want sufficient and convenient transportation at reasonable rates. We want adequate facilities and supplies for camping out at lowest prices. We want good fishing. We want our wild, we want our wild animal life conserved and developed. We want special facilities for nature study. Does he sound like a promoter of the idea of a park? And the business interests uh, were caught in this idea as well. So you, you see that the park idea uh, had support. Uh, even a, a magazine called National Geographic, uh, the, the owner editor Grosvenor wrote an article about the national parks in Yellowstone, in particular, 1916. And he published enough, enough extra copies that he handed it out to every member of Congress. Well, you know what? That helped grease the skids to set aside that first national park of Yellowstone in 1872. Now, let me quickly add that three years later, they created a national park here in Michigan. Do you know that Fort Mackinac was the second national park in 1875? It was occupied yet by the U.S. Army, but it was a national park. And as, as the nation changed increasingly, the Army pulled out of Fort Mackinac in 1895, and Congress decommissioned Fort Mackinac as a national park but, but working with the state of Michigan, established the first state park in Michigan. That's Fort Mackinac. Well, it's, it's a marvelous resource that many of you, I bet, have enjoyed, and one that certainly merits uh, the, the qualification of being a national park, but it's, it's numero uno of parks in Michigan in the state park system here. Uh, it's it's a, a, a very good location uh, and was the second national park. Quickly following 1875, there were a number of other national parks created, enhanced by magnificent paintings, by not only more by Moran, but by, uh, by Bierstadt, Alfred, Bier, Alf, Alfred Bierstadt, painted a number of paintings that are hanging in art galleries in the United States yet today. And there were landscape photographers kind of in the tradition of William Henry Jackson, like Ansel Adams, who shot a lot of black and white film of national parks, and who was very active as a member of an, a fledgling organization out in California called the Sierra Club, uh, as was John Muir for that, for that matter. Uh, in the 1890s, Congress established Sequoia National Park. Uh, Yosemite came as a national park out of state management. Uh, and also, uh, there was a park called General Grant. It's, it's the big sequoia trees, and they changed that name to Kings Canyon. Maybe in California, you visited Sequoia Kings Canyon National Park but that in 1890 came in. And they were mindful of that quote that I just read from you. Uh, the early managers in the parks tried to provide good fishing and good sightseeing for large mammals. You know, not every mammal qualifies, right? You, you wanna see a grizzly bear, but you don't want some wolf chasing that grizzly bear, right? So you take care of the wolf population. You decimate it. You decimate the coyote population. Uh, they would bring down elk like with the wolves or deer. So, so we wanted our large mammals, but we didn't want all of them. We just wanted those that we found favor with. I think that wolf idea really goes back to Western Europe and Little Red Riding Hood, remember? <laughs> It, it, it seems to me that uh, 
the National Park Service was managing tourism. It's, it's kind of a utilitarian notion that tourism is an economic driver, and it's true. If you look at those areas around the entrances to national parks today, some of them are, are really disaster areas where they figure out how to get you away from your wallet and buy a, lot of money, buy a lot of things, souvenirs and so on. But they, they are mindful of what in the National Park Service we would call front country. That is the entrance communities to a national park. Years ago, I was on a long range management team that did a plan for the front country of Denali National Park up in Alaska. And we, we tried to work with the local population, the county commission, uh, other agencies of state government to develop an idea of, instead of growth helter-skelter outside of Denali, that there needed to be some management of that growth and not just crazy wild like you see in many places, I suspect you visited some of those front country places here in the lower 48. But it's important that we understand uh, that setting aside land is a kind of new idea and it evolves into managing tourism. Now, I said to cl a class this morning that I shouldn't use that word tourism. We were instructed as, as a fledgling in the National Park Service that we, tourists don't come to parks, visitors come to parks. It's important that hospitality be extended like I have been extended, my wife and I here at Calvin. And so they're visitors and it's important that they have a good experience. And we speak bureaucratically of visitor experience. It's important to do that. Um, there's, there's importance in making people feel like they're having a good time by accommodations in the park, lodging meals, souvenir shops, trails of all sorts, overlooks and views, uh, just a variety of things. Uh, Carl, would you turn back on that map of the US? This more recent map, not the latest edition, uh, I don't think there's a later edition than I was able to get for this presentation, but you'll see the parks scattered all across the United States. And this grouping represented on the map um, exists all over the country, but let me call your attention to this area. Have you visited those national parks? Some of them, maybe all of them but it's important that you keep in mind that notion of find your park. You can find several right here in Michigan. Uh, it's, it's an important part of what I'd argue is the quality of life in Michigan and in the United States. To be able to visit those parks, or maybe better yet, to think you can visit them. Just knowing that they're there is good for the spirit. It's important to know that there's land set aside. And furthermore, it's going to be handed off to the students of Calvin and their offspring and their offspring to convey this into the future. It's, it's really a, an important thing to be able to do. Well, this year in, in moving from national parks to the National Park Service is the, establish, is the centennial of the establishment of the National Park Service as an agency of the federal government housed in the Department of Interior because at Yellowstone in many places they learned that there's too few people managing these parks and there's too much poaching going on, cutting of trees, uh, dipping your, your hanky in the, in the hot pots of Yellowstone, you know, and seeing how it bubbles up. You can imagine what must be down below. Um, after years of doing that sort of thing. But 
The idea that there would be managers of national parks came about through a push to develop an agency called the National Park Service. And this year, in celebrating the National Park Service, I don't think my timer is on here, um, so I, I'm mindful of, of going over. I, yeah, poor eyes. Thank you, thank you. Um, the, no the notion of setting aside parks and now having a National Park Service uh, being established in August of, of 1916 is the centennial of the management of all of these parks. Now, there, there was a national committee, and I'd like to recognize um, Bruce Matthews if he's in the audience, because he was on the national committee. He's with the North Country Trail Association. Bruce, wave your hand if you're in the audience. I'm not sure he is. But I know the superintendent of North Country, Mark Weaver's here, because he has to claim this hat later. Um, any, anyway, uh, Bruce was on a national committee for the centennial. And it's, it's important to recognize the 100th anniversary. And we hope that it's a recharge of the idea of setting aside land, not to set aside more necessarily, but to take care of what we have, which if you follow any news reports, often speak about the backlog of maintenance that is needed in national parks. The fact that it's deferred and deferred and deferred. But after the establishment of the National Park Service in 1916, more parks came into the system, uh, as we would call it. Parks like Mesa Verde, an archaeological site in southwest Colorado in 1906. Devil's Tower in northwest Wyoming. Mount Olympus, now called Olympic National Park in Washington. Grand Canyon, that erosion project out in the southwest. Um, so, you, so you have a number of parks coming in. And to be sure, there's, there's a business driver to all of these because like Grand Canyon, you could get close with the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railway hauling people to Grand Canyon, but the line didn't go past the Grand Canyon, but west of Flagstaff is Williams, Arizona, and you can get out of your car and get on a train and go north to the south rim of the Grand Canyon yet today, a very popular way to visit that national park. So there were any number of other parks that came in. Parks like Grand Teton National Park, adjacent to Yellowstone in the south, uh, in the valley uh, to the south, the, the Teton Valley uh, is another example. Denali in Alaska, Zion and Bryce in Utah, Acadia, Great Smokies, and Shenandoah uh, in that period right after the establishment of the National Park Service. And Civil War battlefields became a very popular one. In, in 1933, battlefields like Antietam and Shiloh and Gettysburg, Chickamauga, Chattanooga, all came to the National Park Service to manage. They had been managed by the War Department which is a predecessor of the Defense Department today, the War Department managed those battlefields, and often they had military cemeteries associated with them. But in 1933, a decision was made that it's going to be managed by the National Park Service. And so all of those were migrated, so to speak, to management by the Park Service. So they became Gettysburg National Battlefield Park or Antietam National Battlefield Park or Pea Ridge National Battlefield, uh, which is in Northwest Arkansas. So there are, are a number of parks that come in like that. And then finally, I, I would add that through a series of directors of the National Park Service, you, you had the expansion, not only of parks, but of facilities. In the 19, late 1950s and the 1960s, was a program that Conrad Wirth, the director of the Park Service led that is called Mission 66. And they put up a terrific number of buildings, visitor centers, uh, various kinds of museums, housing for employees and so on. And if you go to a park today, 
if, if you look at kind of that tract house that you'd find in a suburb someplace, that's a Mission 66 house. You can tell them quickly. They, they were kind of hastily put up because housing was poor for employees, but I can assure you it's still true. There's some parks that I've been in over the recent years that have employee housing that should be like um, a mobile home in a museum somewhere. It, it's just uh, rather sad to see, but that maintenance backlog is, is critical, I think. Quickly, there were national recreation areas added like in, in San Francisco and in New York City. Uh, those, those gateway, for example, in New York City, uh, Santa Monica Mountains near Los Angeles, the Cuyahoga Valley down here. Do you use the word Ohio here in Michigan? <laughs> Any, anyhow, it's one of those parks in Ohio, you know. Um, so there, there are a number of them. And then finally, the last graphic, uh, Carl, would you put on the national trail system? Well, here's the mission in 1916 that established the national park, the park system, the National Park Service. And here you'll see a kind of a contradiction. That is to conserve the scenery and the national historic objects and the wildlife and to provide enjoyment. You see the tension built into that? You want visitors, but you want to protect. That's a heck of a challenge for an agency to grapple with. And the Park Service hasn't always done that very well. Uh, there are any number of instances that would illustrate this point. Uh, that's that's a, a, a terrace in Yellowstone National Park, that slide. Uh, so something, something that depicts our first national park. And then the last slide is one of the national trail system. And I, I want to illustrate this just to say there's kind of a net laying across the United States of national scenic trails like the North Country and national historic trails. And so uh, I, I would encourage you to get out and enjoy uh, those kinds of experiences on the national trails. Um, having misread my clock, I, I need to wrap up and say it's important that you find your park that you enjoy some of the centennial events and, and that you encourage especially youngsters to get to the parks because that's the future of those parks. We need that constituency to come along and evolve and develop. Now, I've, I've run myself out of time, but there's some time for questions. the ushers would collect questions, but I have several already, and there are the two most popular ones I want to be sure to ask you. One is that we have several students wondering if they're interested in working for the National Park Service, what advice do you have for them? My advice to students wanting to work for the National Park Service is perseverance. <laughs> it's not an easy thing to find employment in the National Park Service. It's important that they gain some experiences as students, maybe volunteering even in a local park, municipal park, or with the National Park. For example, I, I think Superintendent Weaver of North Country would, would talk to individuals who may have an interest in volunteering in that office, or some, perhaps along the North Country National Scenic Trail, or at other parks here in, in Michigan. But the important thing is to try and get yourself built a bit of a resume of some experiences that you can translate into strengthening your application. Uh, a, a short point. Our oldest son, when I was park historian at Ozark National Scenic Riverways in southern Missouri, uh, 
uh, was in junior high. Remember when we used to use that word? Now it's middle school or something, I guess. <laughs> Any, anyhow, uh, Jeff decided, and probably his mother prompted him, or maybe I did too, to find something to do. <laughs> he volunteered on the garbage truck. And he, he helped empty, empty garbage cans around the campground and the park. Some years later, he was looking for part-time work, and he filled out a form for a seasonal park position, and he got points, mind you, for being a volunteer in a national park. And he parlayed that into uh, a position on the mall in Washington, D.C. as a seasonal ranger guiding tours at the Jefferson and the Lincoln and the Vietnam Memorial uh, the Washington Monument. Now, he didn't make a career out of the National Park Service, but that illustrates my point, I think. The other question. Great. The other question is, what's your favorite National Park site and why? <laughs> my, my favorite among them all, it's hard to do this, is to, as I said to class earlier today, I believe Yellowstone is my favorite National Park. I know something about its history, but after I retired, I worked there as a volunteer two summers. And I learned more about Yellowstone then than I did before, uh, just being on the fringes of the park. And I, I worked in a little military post before the National Park Service. Yellowstone was managed by the US Army and they had some military posts scattered around the park to prevent poaching and all kinds of other nefarious activity. And I worked in a museum that told that story. Uh, it was really the Museum of the National Park Ranger at Norris Junction, where the geyser basin is, or east of Canyon, where the waterfalls are, some 17 miles. Thank you. Jerry Krakow will be in the West Lobby to greet you. Thanks for your day.